with two groups, such as two tribes that I was working with in northern Nigeria that were at war with each other. And I ask, what needs of yours are not being met? And I'm confident if we can get everybody's needs clarified, we'll find a strategy for meeting the needs of people on both sides. And a member from the, a chief from the Christian tribe immediately screams across the table, these people are murderers. And the other people scream back, these people have been dominating us for 80 years. See, I asked for needs, and they both gave me an analysis of the other side's pathology. Sometimes the analysis takes the form of, well, uh, our constitution says, and the other side says, no, it doesn't say that, it says, uh, or the Bible says, no, but the Koran says. Uh, so when people are, when I ask for needs, and they immediately go into these intellectual judgments that justifies their position, I translate that into what needs I hear being expressed through that. So when the chief screamed, you people are murderers, I said, chief, are you, is, are you saying that your need for safety isn't being met? You see, so I hear the need behind his analysis. And if I guess wrong, he can help me, but I'm looking for needs. But I happen to guess right, that's not too hard to guess what the need might be. He said, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. And I try to get the other side to hear the need. So I said, would a chief on this side please tell me what you heard this chief said his needs were? A chief on the other side of the table screamed across the table, then why did you kill my son? You see, uh, I had been told ahead of time that three people in the room knew that somebody who had killed a member of their family was in the group. So it's not easy, even when you get people to express the needs, it's not easy to see that in the other person when you have these enemy images. So I had to work hard to get the chief from the second side to just, just hear that. Just tell me, chief, what do you hear him say? He's saying he has a need for safety. Okay, just even that makes a big difference, you see. We're out of this intellectual analysis justifying position, and we're connecting at the level of human needs. Then I helped the other side get clear what their needs were, and heard by the first side. At that point, one of the chiefs that hadn't said anything jumped up and said, if we know how to speak this way, we don't have to kill each other. You see, it didn't take long, even in this culture, to, for them to, this one chief at least, to see that if you can just talk about your needs and not into this analysis of who's right, who's wrong, we can solve anything. So we not only have to get one side to say clearly what's alive in them, what needs of yours are not getting met, then I have to get the other side to connect with that. And that's not easy, even if it's a simple message, because if the other side's brain has been programmed to be diagnosing the pathology in this person, uh, even if I've said this person says he has a need for safety, I had to ask that person at least three or four times to repeat it back after I repeated it, because his first reaction is, and why did you kill my son? And then the next one was, you can't trust these people. They'll say anything. And then it took a while before I could give him the understanding he needed to be able to just hear the simple phrase. A man said he has a need for safety that isn't being met by the way some of the conflicts are being dealt with. Whew, that took a lot of work just to get that far. But once I got there. So the empathy is the second party seeing this other person's humanness. And the way we see the humanness is by seeing the needs without these enemy images clouding that. It's not easy to do that. It requires full presence to what is alive in this other person. We teach people how to hear the needs on two parts of ourself. The one part of ourself is that part that evaluates what we do. Every action we take, we need to evaluate it about whether it meets our needs or not. If I cook a meal for myself, I need to evaluate, did that meet my need for nurturance, taste, and so forth? And if it didn't, then I want to change that. So whether it's something I did for myself, or if I say something to another person, Sometimes it doesn't meet the needs of mine, so I need to evaluate it. Now, how do I evaluate it? If I evaluate it by attacking myself, I say that was a stupid thing to do. We instead suggest to people that you evaluate what you do by whether it met your needs or not. 
you'll find that you can learn better without losing self-respect. If we can learn from our mistakes by being conscious of what need wasn't met to begin with, and then to understand another part of ourself. What need were we trying to meet by doing what we did? So that's the same process I was saying using between two groups, but I'm using it within myself between two different functions within myself. The function that evaluates what I do, the function that chooses to do what I do. And if I evaluate them in the way I was educated to evaluate, I'd say to myself, that was a stupid thing to do. How could you do something so dumb? And then if I look at the other side of myself about why I do it, well, I had to do it. I had no choice. It denies responsibility. And I can have that going on within myself forever. And if I do, I'll have a lot of depression, guilt, and shame. And it will be very hard to learn from my human limitations. But if I can see the truth, the truth is I didn't meet this need of mine by what I did. What need was I trying to meet? Oh yeah, I was trying to meet this need. Well, it met that need, but it didn't. the way I did it didn't meet this other need. Okay, how do I get both needs met? If I can think in terms of needs, I'm far more likely to learn from my limitations without losing self-respect. In our training, we suggest to people that we look at what causes things like depression. We look at it in a way other than to think that it's because there's something wrong with us that we get depressed. That it's a mental illness. Uh, we have reasons for worrying about the whole concept of mental illness. We think that some people who we call mentally ill, they have some physical problems that affect their thinking and their, their chemistry so that they think that they're something they're not or they think that people are uh, trying to attack them that aren't. So this can be caused by some physical di dysfunction and there, I wouldn't want to call them mental illnesses. I would want to say the person has a, a neurological or a chemical imbalance or something. These are the smallest percentage of people who get labeled mentally ill have th those kind of problems. The others, I think it's a very unscientific f uh, term to use mental illness. But worse than unscientific, by making it seem like people have something wrong within them, uh, we don't look at what really contributes to things like depression and to the kind of violence we have on the planet. Our understanding in nonviolent communication is that people get depressed, very depressed, because of how they're trained to think, how they're educated to think and they get stuck in this thinking and depression is the result of it. So we don't see it as an illness. We, with people that have that, we try to help them become conscious of what you're telling yourself that's making you so depressed. And then we show them how what you're telling yourself, the judgments you make of yourself, simply are a, resulting because a need of yours hasn't been met. And unfortunately we haven't been educated to get connected to the need so when that need isn't being met, you go up to your head and start blaming yourself, shaming yourself, attacking yourself. And the depression is an inevitable result of how you think about yourself. So we show people how to transform that thinking about themselves into a language of life. If, if you say, I shouldn't be depressed, or there's something wrong with me for being depressed, which is what we give the idea to people, that you're mentally ill if you are depressed or you have bipolar illness, uh, they now not only have the results of this thinking that makes them depressed, now they think there's something wrong with them for being depressed. So they're doubly depressed because they're judging themselves for judging themselves. So we say, no, there's nothing wrong with you that you do that. You think that way because you were trained to think that way. Now there's some beauty in it. If you can see the need of yours that wasn't met behind that, you can learn from something. You can better meet your needs. But if you don't get connected to the need of yours that isn't being met, you just stay up in your head saying, I'm a failure. I'll never amount to anything. Or you ask yourself unanswerable questions such as, why did I do that? When you really know the answer, you're already telling yourself, I did it because I'm a failure. I'm a loser. So if you just communicate that way internally, you're going to spend a good deal of your life being depressed. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It means you've been educated to think that way.